Well, hello, Thrive Church. Are you excited to be here today? Man, I am so, so excited to see all that God is doing in our church. And and uh, I, I'm Judah, the lead pastor here at Thrive, and I want to welcome you. I want to thank you for coming and joining us today. And, you know, several weeks back, uh, we, we put out this challenge where we were uh, investing in our church, in the people of our church, and, and inspiring you to, to take some, some money that we provided and either do some good for somebody, use it for your own special needs, or to invest it and bring it back and whatever proceeds we were going to use to uh, to drill wells in Asia. And uh, and we began uh, collecting that last week. We're still collecting that this week. For every $1,400 that comes in, we'll be able to drill a well. And, uh, and this gives uh, fresh, clean drinking water to people who have uh, the need for that. We take it for granted, the fact that we can go and we can get drinking water whenever we need, but some people uh, in this world, even this day, that the their primary goal is to just get any kind of water, and it's not even fresh. It often has bacteria and contaminants in it. Their families are sick and unhealthy as a result, so this gives us an opportunity to do good for some people, but not only that, we drill the wells right near a church, so when they come to get their drinking water, they can also encounter the living water, and so we're, we're uh, still collecting that. If God has put it on your heart to maybe do something creative, we've heard all kinds of creative stories of how people were raising resources for that or if God just puts it on your heart. So far, we have enough that has come in uh, last week that we're going to be drilling six wells already. So... uh so that's awesome uh, to, to see, and, and I, I want to uh, be able to even drill more. So uh, we would just encourage you to, to partner with us uh, as we partner with Gospel for Asia in drilling these wells. We are in our series, uh, Lightly Salted Nuts, and this is all about being the salt and light and, and hopefully doing it in a way that's not too nutty, right? Like we, we've all seen people, especially people who are, are calling themselves Christians who are a little bit nutty, and you can look at them and say, you know what? I love Jesus, but I don't want to be like you, man. Like, like I, I don't want to. I don't want to stand out in the corner holding a sign that says "Turn or Burn." I, I don't want to act this way. I don't want to be, you know, judgmental of people. And, and, and so I believe that we can be salt and light. We can influence this world. We can impact the world in a positive way. In a way that doesn't put people off. And and, and it's all about sharing our faith. How do we share our faith? with others. This is a very important part of being a follower of Jesus Christ, how we share our faith, but it can get really weird really quick. And if you've ever watched some of these televangelists, you know it can get really weird really quick. And sometimes we see that in this idea of, of, of what it means to share your faith that gets really weird. In fact, even the word that we use is kind of weird. We use this word evangelism. Well, what is that? What, what picture comes in your mind when you hear the word evangelism? You know, for some of you, maybe it's a good picture, but for some of us, it's not a very good picture. It's somebody trying to maybe get money on late night TV. Maybe it's somebody holding up that turn or burn sign. Maybe it's somebody trying to, to manipulate someone into to maybe giving their uh, life over to Jesus Christ. And it can be very awkward and, and off-putting. So, so I decided to Google uh, how to evangelize. Um, and it was very interesting. Like, like WikiHow had a whole thing. It was like like 14 steps in, on how to share your faith and, and all these great clip art images that go along with it. Um, there was also other articles I saw, like 10 ways to, to evangelize and six tips on how to share your faith and 10 proven strategies. And as I was reading it, I couldn't help but feeling like, like it was like some kind of MLM. You, you know what MLM, like the multi-level marketing? Has anybody ever been solicited for MLM before, okay? Uh, some of you have. Some of you are like, I, I solicit people for MLM all the time. And if you do, God bless you. Um, I'm not interested, but, uh, but you know, MLMs are, are great. And I say I'm not interested because I was in an MLM for a very short period of time. It was not the greatest period in my life, but uh, I was in this thing. And, and, and the first thing they say is go find your friends and family and try to basically convince them to buy this. And, and, and you're like, you know, whenever you've been solicited, you know, it's, it's kind of awkward because somebody that you haven't heard from in a while is like, hey, how's it going? I just want to reconnect. 
Like, oh, okay, sure, let's reconnect. Like, yeah, I just want to get together and hang out a little bit, maybe talk about your financial situation. It's like, hold on, hold on. They get there, they, they break out the flip chart, and it's like, okay, here we are, and, and here, if you buy it now, you'll make $100,000 a month in the next six months or something crazy like that. And, uh, and we start to feel like sharing our faith is kind of like that. And if you're here, if you're a guest with us, you might think this is kind of weird. We're talking about sharing your faith. And you're like, ah, I, I was you know, just invited to come today and here I am. And, and we're gonna let you see a little bit behind the scene. And hopefully while you're here, you can hear our heart and why we want to share our faith. If, if you're here for the first time, we hope that you still find it enjoyable uh, and, uh, and helpful. And even if you don't entirely believe in God and Jesus Christ, that's okay. That's okay. We still welcome you here. In fact, we say around here that we invite you to belong even before you believe. Some people come here and, and they haven't fully believed everything yet. And that's okay. We, we want you to come. And, and this is a safe place for you to explore your faith and learn about Jesus and learn why we are so passionate about Jesus Christ. See, it's our mission here at Thrive. You can write this in your notes that we want to be a church that unchurched people love. We want to be a church where, where if you've never been to church or you've been burned by church or you've been turned off by church, then you can come and you'll still feel loved and welcome and accepted. Hopefully you'll feel challenged. Hopefully you can begin to live your life in a more productive way. And as you hear about scripture and about God's word, hopefully it will bring transformation in your life. But a lot of times when we talk about sharing our faith, it becomes these strategies that we learn, this information that we learn of how I can somehow convince somebody to maybe say a sinner's prayer with me, and then I can put a notch in my belt talking about who I led to the Lord. It's information, but there's a difference between information and an invitation. In your notes, you can write this down, that the information is impersonal, but an invitation is personal. An invitation is personal. An invitation is based on relationships. Have you ever gotten invited somewhere before? You've gotten invited, you know, invitations come in all different shapes and sizes. You could have the, the super informal invitation, which is like, hey, would you like to go and grab a coffee tonight? Okay, sure. You know, it, it, it's very informal. There's not much planning behind it, but it's an invitation. We could have other invitations, like, like digital invitations, evites. I got invited to a, a party uh, last week, and, and, and that was a digital invitation, and it's great because you can go and you can click whether you're going or not going or, or whether you might go. And, and it's a different kind of invitation. Or sometimes we get these kind of invitations. It comes in the mail. Some of you have never seen the mail before because we're so used to everything digital, but it's paper and it comes and it gets in a box in your front yard. It's great. And, and it says, oh, there's a party and, and you're invited. So we get invitations like this that will invite us maybe for a bigger, more, uh, more momentous event we'll get an invitation like this, but regardless of how your invitation comes, it all means one thing, and it's in your notes. An invitation says that you are wanted. You are wanted. Your presence is requested. You are welcome. You are included. You are invited. We want you to come. We want you to be here. You are someone that we have deemed valuable, and I want you to come. Now, Jesus Christ was the greatest inviter of all time. He just went around inviting people, inviting people to come and to follow him. And if you study the life of Jesus, you find that he never tried to convince anybody. He never tried to coerce somebody. He never tried to manipulate somebody. In fact, he often discouraged people. He's like, you know, hey, if you got to go do this and that, just don't even bother. And he would just simply come up and he would, he would say, oh, just, just come and Come and follow me. Come and follow me. He was inviting people out of the life that they were in, and he was inviting them into a life that they never believed that they could participate in. He was inviting them into a relationship with God. He was inviting them into being in right standing with God. Jesus was the greatest inviter who ever lived. Jesus was going to Samaria one day. Now, let's keep in mind that Samaria 
was a city that most Jews never wanted to go there. There's probably some cities that you could think of that you never want to go there. Well, Samaria was like that. In fact, most Jews would take, uh, they would go out of their way to avoid Samaria. They would go the long way around so that way they wouldn't have to go through Samaria. Yet Jesus on this day went out of his way to go to Samaria. And he shows up at Samaria, and his disciples, his followers, his friends, they were off doing something else. And and Jesus shows up around noontime at a well. And as he's there, a woman comes up and begins to draw water from this well. And Jesus speaks to this woman, this woman who was from Samaria, and he says, would you mind getting me something to drink? Now, she is astonished because in that day and age, for a Jew to speak to a Samaritan was unheard of. The, the, the Jews looked down on the Samaritans. The Samaritans didn't like the Jews either. And, and here they are in the middle of the day. Why are they there in the middle of the day? Because this woman, as we find out, didn't have the best reputation in her life. She didn't have a good reputation. She had sin and shame in her life. So, so most probably she was coming in the middle of the day to avoid the crowds. She didn't want to be looked down upon. Most people would come and gather water in the cool of the day, the mornings or the evenings. Here she is in the hottest part of the day when hopefully nobody would be there. And here is this Jewish man sitting there and he asks her for a drink of water. And they started talking about water. Tart start talking about water. And and she's like, well, why are you asking me for water? He said, will you give me some water? He says, if you knew who I was, Jesus says, if you knew who I was, you'd be asking me for water because I have water that if you drink it, you'll never get thirsty again. Now her mind is blown. She's like, I want some of this magic water, right? Like I I want some, I, I can take a sip and I'll never be thirsty again. I want some of this water. And Jesus says, okay, great. I'll tell you all about it. Go get your husband. And she's like, hold on a second. I don't have a husband. Jesus is like, yeah, I know. You're right. You had five husbands. And the person you're living with now isn't even your husband. And she's like, whoa. Like, how did you know this? Like, how did you know what's going on in my personal life? And and, and then at this moment, she realizes that she's speaking not to just a man, but, but someone who is the son of God. She leaves her jar there at the well, and she runs back to the village. Have you ever went somewhere and then forgot why you're there? Like, like she went to the well to get water and then she forgot the water. Have, have you ever done that? Like this happens to me on a regular basis. My wife will send me to the grocery store to pick something up. And, and it's like usually like a really long list, like two things. And, and I'll get to the grocery store and I'm like wandering the aisles. I'm like, what was I supposed to get here? And I'm wandering the aisles hoping something will trigger a memory until I have to like humble myself and text her and say, what did you want again? And, uh, and usually I end up home with, with more things that, than she requested, usually having to do with ice cream. But um, here she is, she went to the well and she leaves her water there because she's going back to tell the townspeople What's going on? She goes there and she says, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Now, he didn't really tell her everything, but he did say this thing about her husband. And then she brings these people back. Now we're gonna pick up in John 4, verse 40. Look what he says. It says, when they came out, all these village people come out to see him and they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. And then, he said, and then they said to the woman, now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the savior of the world. All of these people came and they heard the message. And they said, we believe now, not because you told us, but because we heard Jesus ourselves. But here's the thing. Had she not went out there and invited them, they would have never heard. It was the, the simple act of going out to the village and inviting people to come and hear the message of Jesus Christ that many lives were transformed that day. See, Jesus was a great inviter. Jesus is someone who is giving an invitation to you and to me. In your notes, Jesus sees people others don't see, and he includes people that others don't include. See, this invitation that Jesus gives, it's for everybody. It's for the people who are a little bit weird and a little bit odd, much like many of us in here. Like The the invitation that God gives, that Jesus gives, is for the people that others may overlook. We see that Jesus, when he was pursuing his followers, He pursued ordinary people. He pursued fishermen and tax collectors. 
These are people that other rabbis would have rejected and overlooked. But, but Jesus found these people. Jesus was seeking out these people. And he was calling them to follow him. He was calling them something. He was calling them not who they were at that moment, but who he knew they could become, who they were created to be. He was calling this out of them. And we see the simple thing that he would say in Matthew 4, 19. It says, and he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Underline those words, fishers of men. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. See, Jesus didn't call them out to come and, and to, to be more wealthy. He didn't call them to be nicer or better. He wasn't calling them to any of these things. He says, I want you to come follow me and I want you to be a fisher of men. Has anybody here ever been fishing before? Anybody been fishing? Okay, like most of you have been fishing here, okay? You know, fishing is, uh, is, is great. And, and you know, the thing I know about fishing is that there's some people who are really, really good at fishing. But anybody can do it, right? Anybody can go fishing, but there's some people that are really, really good at it. In fact, uh, I, I like to fish, and um, I went out uh, a couple years ago with my dad. We, uh, we, we hired this really expensive guide, and we were out fly fishing for a couple of days. We had a, a really good time, but... Uh, but it, it, we, just, we just didn't really connect that much. You know, we're out there fishing for all this time. And, and finally, finally, we ended up catching one fish on the whole trip, one fish. But it was amazing though. It was an amazing fish. And the reason why is because it was late at night. It was dark out there. We're on this boat and our guide is looking on the water. He says, there's a fish right there. We're like, where? He's like, right there. You see that little ripple? We're like, we're in a river. Everything is rippling. <laughs> Right now, he's like, right there, there's a fish. And, and, and so we were casting, and, and, and we're casting. He's like, no, 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 you cast it an inch too far. We're like, what do you mean? And I don't even know what I'm casting at. He's like, try it again, try it again, try it again. And finally, made contact. My dad made contact, and, and the fish took it. And it was a long fight. And it was a long battle. But see, this fisherman, he, was, he knew what he was fishing for. He was getting down on the level of the fish. He knew what he was looking for. Some people are really, really good at knowing what they're looking for, but anybody can do it. But there's one thing that we all know about fishing, and that's that it takes patience, right? It takes patience. You know, we can't just go out there and guarantee that, that we're always gonna catch something because sometimes they're just not biting. Sometimes you go out there and, and it seems like you're just doing amazing, and other times you, you go out there and you don't catch anything. But, but it's the enjoyment of the process. And maybe in your life, there's somebody that you've been praying for in your family. There's somebody that you've been inviting for years and years and years. Well, just keep fishing. Just keep fishing. Just keep loving that person. Just keep being the salt and being the light in that person's life. Just keep dropping your line in that water. Just keep serving them. Just keep inviting them because this is a, a, a long game. It takes some patience. And sometimes people aren't biting and that's okay. We're not trying to twist anybody's arm. So Jesus's goal here was to make his followers fishers of men. What is that? It's an inviter. It's an inviter, somebody to invite. And you notes, we aren't called just to follow. We're called to fish. We're called to fish. We're called to, to invite somebody, to invite somebody. Anybody here like, like Clementines, anyway? Yeah, I like them too. You know, how do you describe the taste of a Clementine? Like, like how, how can you describe it to somebody who's never had it before. Like, have you ever thought about, like, how would you describe it to somebody? You know, I mean, yeah, juicy, but like, what does that mean, though? I mean, let's see, I'm going to have a little bit. That is a good Clementine. <laughs> but you know what? I can't really describe it. Yeah, it's juicy. Yeah, it's, it's kind of sweet, but, but, but there's a lot of things that are like that. But there's only one way that I can really experiences that I can really show. I need somebody to help me real quick. Okay, okay, come on up. Hey, I gave you food before. Come on up, though. Here you go. Try it. Let me know how you, how you like it. Is that good? Pretty good. Can you describe it? I haven't yet. Try it. Yeah. <laughs> you got to hand it out. Well, you can have that. Thank you. You can give him a hand for eating my food. Um, sorry, I can't share it with everybody. But um, here's the thing, though. To be an inviter means, to, here, come taste this. Come try this. Yeah, I can't describe everything, but I can, I can share it with you. I can invite you to experience. We're, we're not just called simply to follow, but to fish. When Jesus 
went and was calling his closest friends, his companions, his disciples. He saw a guy named Andrew. Andrew was a fisherman. He said, Andrew, come follow me. You know what Andrew did? First thing Andrew did is he went and found his brother, Peter. He said, hey, Peter, I just met a guy. I think he's the Messiah. Why don't you come and follow him as well? Now, we know Peter as this great man of God throughout the New Testament, but Andrew was the one who went and invited him. It was another similar story of Philip, and we're going to look at Philip's story in John 1, verse 45. It says, Philip went to look for Nathanael. We don't know how they were, maybe they're, maybe they're brothers, maybe they're friends. We don't entirely know. It says, Philip went to look for Nathanael and told him, we have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph of Nazareth. And it says, Nazareth, exclaimed Nathanael. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Like, this is the response. I don't know why they were saying that. Like, there was maybe some, some bitterness towards Nazareth. And he said, can anything good come from, from Nazareth? And you know what Philip says? Just come and see for yourself. Underline that. Come and see for yourself. He says, hey, come and check out this guy we just met. Hey, you know, I think he's the person the prophets have prophesied about. He says, oh, yeah, prove it. He came from now. He came from where? He says, you know what? I don't know. Just come and check it out yourself. Come and see for yourself. There was no big theological debate. He said, just come and see. Because Philip knew that if he could get Nathaniel in the presence of Jesus, that Jesus would change everything. He knew if I could just get him here to see him, if I could just get him here to hear his voice, that'll change everything. See, Jesus' message for us, Jesus' method for us to reach people in this world, it's not about fancy advertising. It's not about having a convincing argument. It's not about having well-rehearsed scripts. God just wants us to invite, to invite, to invite people, the broken, the hurting, to invite them, to invite them into relationship. See, Jesus, he didn't just see fishermen and tax collectors. He saw people who would spread this movement and ultimately turn the world upside down. But he wants us to be inviters. That's why like here, we have, we have some cards that we have uh, at the info bars. Just a little, you know, just tell us a little bit about the church. It's a way that you can just say, hey, I'm going to invite somebody. You got to eat. Hey, leave one. Leave, leave it with a tip. Don't, don't, don't be cheap though. Okay, please. <laughs> If you're going to be cheap, that's on you. Don't leave our card there. If you're going to leave our card, give it a good tip, okay? In Jesus' name. Um, take one of the, and just invite somebody. Invite somebody. The, the power of the invite. Because in your notes, if we can get our friends in the presence of Jesus, he will change everything. If we can get our friends to hear the message of good news, then, then that will change everything. We need to be come and see people. See, Philip was a come and see person. He says, I don't know. I don't have all the answers for you, Nathaniel. I don't know if anything good could come from Nazareth. I don't know. There's a lot I don't know. But what I do know is this. Why don't you come and check it out yourself? Why don't you come and see for yourself? Why don't you come and, and hear for yourself? I can't tell you everything, but, but just come and see. Just come and see. The only reason why many of you are here even today is because somebody took a risk and invited you. The only reason that many of you are here is somebody stepped out. They were praying for you and said, hey, why don't you come and see? Why don't you come and see? And Jesus is offering an invitation. This is an invitation for every single person. No exceptions. Listen to this invitation in Romans 10, verse 13. It says, for everyone, who? Everyone. Who does that include? Everyone. That means all of us. That means you, me, and the person you hate the most in this world. It says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's an extraordinary invitation. That's extraordinary. He's saying everybody is welcome at my table. Everybody is welcome at my party. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. But verse 14, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? You can't call on him if you don't believe. And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear unless somebody tells them? How can they hear unless if somebody invites them? We need to be 
inviters. We need to be come and see people. Why don't you come and see? I'm just going to invite you. You know, never in the history of the world has it even been easier to invite than it is now. Because now at the click of a button on social media, we can invite all of our friends and family. We can take a stand for Jesus Christ. And all it takes is a little click to say, come and see. We've heard so many stories of people who, who are just sharing a little something, a sermon clip. They were sharing a Bible verse, sharing a little story of what God's done in their life. And it inspired someone to take the step because they were in invited to come and see. Somebody has to tell that friend at school. Somebody has to tell that, that coworker about the love of Jesus. Somebody has to tell the, the family member. Somebody has to invite. You know, some of you know that I, uh, I do some, some arm wrestling. I'm not, I'm not that good at it, but, uh, but, I, but I enjoy it, and I hang out with these guys, and, 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 and I started doing it as a way just to get to know some people that were far from God, and through it, uh, occasionally, I would just throw out an invite. Hey, if anybody wants to come to church, you're, you're welcome, and that, and that struck up some conversations with some friends, and, and over time, we were talking, said, would you, would you mind if I come to your church? I'm like, absolutely, come, and they started to come and grow closer to God, and then they started inviting people, and then they would come and get closer to God. It's the power of the invite. It's the power of just saying, hey, why don't you just come and, come and see? When you experience a great restaurant, you want to tell people about this. Like, you want to let people know, hey, when you go there, like, like, like it, it may not look like it's good on the outside, but the food is good on the inside. Like, you want to go, you want to tell people about this food that you've experienced. When you've seen a good movie, you want to tell somebody, you want to share it. When you have experienced something that brings enjoyment in your life, so why would we not share about Jesus Christ and the hope that he's given us? Why would we not invite someone to church to come and experience the love, the acceptance, the warmth, that people have. You know why a lot of times we don't want to invite? You know why a lot of times we don't want to take the step to be salt and light? Is because we know that we're not perfect. Right? Like I look at myself and I'm like, well, who am I to invite? If, if they knew who I was and they do know who I am, they'll be like, like you have no business inviting me to church. You got no business telling me about Jesus. I, I know how jacked up you were in your life. But in your notes, write this down that you aren't perfect but you are God's perfect choice to speak into somebody's life. You aren't perfect, but you are God's choice to speak into the life of the people you go to school with. You are God's choice to speak in the life of your coworkers. You are God's choice to speak in the life of your family. Even with all of your mistakes, you are God's choice. Even with all of your failures, and maybe, maybe you feel like those things are holding you back, but maybe it's because of those mistakes and failures that you are qualified to speak into their life. Maybe the thing that you think that disqualifies you is actually the very thing that qualifies you because you can speak into the pain. You can speak into the suffering. You can speak into the brokenness. You can speak into the addiction. You can speak into the anxiety, the depression, the fear. You can speak there because you've experienced it and you've gone through it and say, why don't you just come and see, come and see, come and experience the freedom that God has for you. See, we want this church to be a place where broken people can come to, where you can bring people who are far from God and they're not gonna get too weirded out. You know, they're not gonna come and they're not gonna hate the experience, hopefully, that you can invite people to come and say, just come and see, just come and hear the message of good news. And your notes, God has invited us into his family, but he wants us to invite others. He wants us to invite us, he's invited us. He says, I want you to come and be a part of my family, but I want you to invite others. It reminds me of a story that Jesus told. Jesus tells a story about a rich man, and he had a feast. And at this feast, he sent out all these invitations, inviting all of the, the, the who's who in the area. He says, why don't you come to this feast? We're going to have a great party. There's going to be food. There's going to be drinks. There's going to be singing. There's going to be a great time. Why don't you come to this feast? And he sent out the invitations, and then he started getting the excuses. All the excuses why they couldn't come. One guy says, well, I just bought a field that I need to go check it out. It's like, wait a minute. Aren't you supposed to check out the field before you buy it? Like, why? Like this is clearly an excuse. Another guy says, I just bought six pair of oxen and I need to go try them out. Like, really? You didn't try them out before you bought them? Another guy says, I just got married. I can't go. And that guy will cut him a little bit of slack, okay? Um, but these guys are just giving excuse after excuse after excuse, saying why they can't come to this party. And in Luke 14, 21, the servant 
The person who is doing the inviting says the servant returned and told his master what they said. And his master was furious. He says, okay, fine. If they're not going to come, go quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and invite the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And after the servant did this, he reported, I invited all the crippled, I invited all the poor, they're all here, they're all coming to the party, it's great, but there's still room for more. So his master said, okay, go out into the countryside now. Go into the country lanes and behind the hedges. You know who's behind the hedges? Those who are hung over, those who are strung out, they're out there, this is the worst of the worst. Go find them, go go find them, and urge anyone that you find to come so that the house may be full. For none of those who I first invited will even get the smallest taste, but go and find the poorest of the poor. Find the broken, find the hurting, and invite them into my banquet. See, God wants us to be inviters. He sent out this message, and he's invited us into his family. He says, now I want you to go, and I want you to invite people. Invite the poor. Invite the broken. Invite the hurting. Invite those who have shame and guilt. Invite them, because there's room at the table. Urge them to come and we'll find there's an amazing joy that each of us can experience when we realize that God has used our efforts to help someone step out of the darkness into the light. When God has used an invitation, a simple conversation, when God uses you to bring transformation into somebody else's life, there is no greater joy. There is no greater reward to see God move in that way. So let us pray for boldness. Let us pray that we can see people the way God sees them. Pray that God opens our eyes to see the needy, that he opens our ears, that he opens our hearts, that we go up to people and we we reach out to them in love. And if you see somebody hurting, offer to pray for them. Say, can I pray for you? Is there anything in your life right now? We cannot underestimate the power of prayer in these situations. You know, most people in this world have never had another human being pray to the creator of the universe to the, the, uh, with them, for them. They, they, they think of prayer as some ritualistic thing, not an actual relationship. Offer to, hey, can I pray for you? Can I pray for you that, 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 that God will work in your relationship, that God will give you the finances that you need? Can I pray for healing in your life? This is one question that can open up a door that can change their life. You see, Jesus invited people who others rejected. Jesus invited the broken. Jesus invited the hurting. And he invites people to come and get pardoned from their sin. Jesus invites people to come and be forgiven. And he said, now I want you to go and I want you to be inviters too. I want you to pray for people. I want you to invite people to get healed. I want you to invite people so they can experience restoration. I want you to invite. I want you to be the light of the world. I want you to be the salt of the earth, shining brightly, flavoring, seasoning the world around that we can invite them to introduce them to the King of Kings the Lord of the Lords, the one who brings hope and healing and forgiveness into our life. And he's saying, this is my plan for you to go and to be an inviter, to share my love with a broken world. Let's pray. (laughs) Father, we come to you now and we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for inviting us into your family. And we take you at your word where you said anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So if you're here today and and you've never responded to the invitation, now is the time. God has sent you an invitation. And with an invitation, we have to RSVP, say, yeah, I'm coming, I'm coming. And God's inviting you now. So will you, will you RSVP? Will you accept that invitation into my family? Will you call on my name? And if you believe that Jesus is your Lord, won't you call on his name and say, Jesus, you are my Lord. And Father, for those of us here who have been following you for maybe a couple weeks, maybe a couple years, Lord, make us into inviters. Give us your boldness. Open up our eyes to see the hurting. Open up our ears to hear. 
Lord, let us be inviters. Let us be men and women and children who are willing to share your faith with this world. Give us your boldness. Give us your desire to see lives transformed, to see people step out of the darkness and into the light. Lord, let our lights shine brightly. Let us reflect your light to this dark world. Let us be the salt of the earth, bringing seasoning, softening hearts. Lord, use us to create a thirst for you. So we say, use us. Give us opportunities, even this week, Lord, that we can invite somebody to come to church, that we can invite them to get to know you better, that we can have a conversation about you, not one that is judgmental or putting anybody down, not that it's manipulative, Lord, but let us have an opportunity to just bring an invitation, an invitation into your family. And we thank you for using us and choosing us to spread your good news to this world in Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen and amen. 